somewhere beyond this ridge is the enemy. His strength has been sapped by steady aerial strikes. And heavy artillery barrages. But he is still a long way from being defeated. He still has his will to fight. How can we weaken that will? How can we defeat him? By physical force? Yes, that's the most effective way. But there's still another force applied in combat that we generally don't think of as a weapon of war. That weapon is words. Yes, in a situation like this, words are weapons. Now that the enemy has had a strong dose of our military power, the impact of words may provide the final persuasion. Words that go something like this. Soldiers of North Korea, you are surrounded. Your comrades are dying. You will die next. There is just one hope. Leave your positions tonight. This is psychological warfare, or at least it's one phase. As a weapon of war, psychological warfare is no novelty. It is as old as war itself. But the use of this force as an integral part of combat has now taken on new forms. And it works in many different ways. The printed word and the spoken word both hammer away at a single objective, defeat the enemy. On 25 June 1950, the enemy, his morale at its peak, had few weak spots that could be attacked psychologically. Still within 48 hours of the outbreak of fighting in Korea, the UN began waging its psi war battle in support of our military objectives. First operations parallel the early techniques of World War II, when psychological warfare played a big supporting role in the military theater. Initially, Psy War was forced to conduct a defensive action. Its propaganda was designed to uplift the badly sagging morale of the South Koreans. Then, as our military effort shifted from defensive to offensive, so did Psy War. Result? Desertion. Dissension lowered morale, and surrender. Our propaganda was beginning to pay off. Meanwhile, the national program found its stride. On 15 January 1951, at the top army level, Psy War was established as a special staff agency. This move had far-reaching results. In civilian colleges and universities, long-range recruiting and educational programs were instituted. Laboratory experiments and research led to new and better psychological warfare. Reserve units were recalled and several new units activated. And at Fort Riley, Kansas, a Psy War training school was established. Here, recruits with specialized backgrounds were taught the nature, methods, and techniques of propaganda and its dissemination. Coincidentally, plans were launched for the permanent training center now located at Fort Bragg. Meanwhile, like the fighting in Korea, Psy War operations went into high gear. At General Headquarters, Tokyo, staff planning and supervision are handled by the Psy War section, while the operating unit in Tokyo is the first radio broadcasting and leaflet group. This group conducts strategic propaganda and supports the tactical operation in Korea. Currently broadcasting in Japan and Korea, are 32 radio stations. For about four hours every evening, this station delivers propaganda that thrusts at the communists in North Korea with facts. Radio presents these facts in any number of ways. Perhaps its most rewarding form of expression is news. News is ready-made propaganda, and to an enemy denied access to outside information, is as welcome as food and water. 
In addition to news, radio employs other techniques to attract the maximum audience. For example, messages from prisoners of war are broadcast, assuring their families that they are safe and well cared for. These awaited messages induce the enemy civilian to turn his set on. And to make sure he'll keep it on, prisoner of war messages are spotted at different times during the week. Often a radio program takes the form of a drama, such as we see now. Dramatization is close to the oriental mind, for ever since his earliest schooling, the average Far Easterner has been taught by having things acted out for him. Carefully planned and rehearsed, these dramatic offerings play heavily upon the emotions. There is no strict evaluation of radio's achievement, but with the constant repetition of the free world's point of view, it is certain to have a cumulative effect upon the enemy nerve. In this effort to weaken and harass the enemy, programs are also broadcast from mobile units in the field. Completely self-sustaining, they perform in numerous ways, as a relay station for larger networks, as a stopgap to fill a temporary void, or to lend direct support to the tactical operation. At the radio broadcasting and leaflet group Central Printing Plant near Tokyo are produced all strategic and many of the stock tactical leaflets. Every leaflet has a central idea or issue which in turn is exploited by any number of themes. For instance, themes may strive to lower the enemy's morale and make him more susceptible to tactical propaganda when he reaches the front lines. In these cases, leaflets stress such points as the UN stand against aggression, the historic friendship between the United States and the people of China and Korea, the unfulfilled promises of communist leaders, and the horror of death away from home and family, along with the mounting numbers of communist casualties. Leaflets also stress the humane treatment of prisoners of war. And finally, the methods of surrender. 